He runs away naked. He gave all, including his clothes, to run away. How do we change our stinking thing? Attitude is everything. We are what we think. What we think in our minds is who we are. We are the product of our thoughts. Our attitudes affect every aspect of our lives, our happiness, our relationships, our successes, and even our health. In fact, if we're not careful, our thinking can become self-destructive. How do we change our stinking thinking? Welcome back. We're given the privilege of seeing how attitude impacts our decisions. And by it, we learn what we can do to manage our own thinking. So please stay and continue this journey with us. But before we begin, as always, let's pray. Holy Father, we are continuously bombarded by bad and self-destructive thoughts. Teach us how to manage our thinking. In Jesus' name, amen. Imagine walking through life with a heavy heart, burdened by worry, fear, and doubt. Now change the picture. See yourself walking that path, but this time with hope, confidence, and a positive attitude. Which journey do you think would be easier? Attitude is everything. The way we think and feel affects every part of our lives. It affects how we handle challenges, how we treat others, and even how we see ourselves. In Mark 14, we see Jesus facing the most difficult times of his life. Mark chapter 14 through 16 are known as the Passion Narrative. They describe Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection. These chapters, as noted in Lesson 9, cover just one week. But what a week it was! You can view Lesson 9 at sabbathschooldaily.com. Most of the events described in Mark 14 through 16 happen on Thursday and Friday of the Passion Week right before Jesus dies on the cross. On Friday, Jesus dies, and on Sunday, he rises from the dead. We focus on Mark 14, which begins with the fifth sandwich story. A sandwich story is a story within a story. Review our previous lessons at SabbathSchoolDaily.com to learn more about the other sandwich stories in the book of Mark and the details of what a sandwich story is. The sandwich story in Mark 14 links two opposite actions in relation to Jesus, followed by the Lord's Supper. Then we come to the Garden of Gethsemane. Here Jesus is overwhelmed with sorrow and fear. In Mark 14, 36, he prays and he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Jesus knew what was coming, yet he submitted to God's will. His attitude wasn't one of defeat, but of trusting in and obeying his father. Even when things seemed their darkest, he chose to trust in the father's plan. Our attitude truly is everything. Just as Jesus chose to trust God's plan, even when it led to suffering, when we focus on God's love, his will and plan for us and follow Jesus' example, we find strength, hope, and victory over whatever comes our way. It is all wrapped up in having the right attitude. In Mark 14, 1 through 14, we read of how a woman's attitude toward Jesus made her the top social influencer of her day and even up to our day. What was her attitude? Read Mark 14, 1 through 14, then continue to part two, unforgettable. Many times we find ourselves at a crossroad where we must make choices that could change everything. The decisions we make at these crossroads show who we really are and what we truly value. They show our real attitude. We explored two powerful stories from Mark 14, 1 through 11, which are intertwined and play off one another. They are two very different stories that happen at the same time. They are sandwich stories. 
This passage is the fifth sandwich story in the Gospel of Mark. View Lesson 3 at SabbathSchoolDaily.com for more details on sandwich stories. This sandwich story helps us see how our attitudes shape our actions, our lives, and ultimately our character, who we are. The main story is about the Jewish leaders who are plotting to kill Jesus. Mark 14.1 tells us that it's the week of the Passover, just two days before the feast. And these Jewish leaders are meeting to find a way to arrest Jesus and have him killed. After two days, it was the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes saw how they might take him by trickery and put him to death. Now, they just need a way someone to help them make it happen. They're desperate and need help to carry out their evil plot. Surprisingly, their help comes from an unexpected source. The Jewish leader's plot against Jesus is intertwined with the story of a woman who anoints Jesus' head with valuable perfume. This story gives us a clue as to where the Jewish leader's help will come from. Notice Judas, one of Jesus' disciples, attitude as opposed to the woman with perfume. The two characters in the story, both Judas and the woman with the perfume, take opposite actions, showing their differences in attitude. The woman in this story does something amazing. Who the woman is, is not revealed, but her influence will live on. She comes to Jesus with a jar of very expensive perfume and pours it on Jesus's head. This perfume is worth a whole year's wage. And when she pours it on Jesus, the guests at the dinner are disgusted. They see it as a waste of money to pour perfume valued at nearly a year's wage on Jesus. But Jesus steps in to defend her, saying in Mark 14, 9, Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. He points out that what she has done will be remembered and shared wherever the gospel is preached. In other words, her influence will not be forgotten. In fact, all four gospels share this story in one form or another. To this day, she has received billions of views. Thus, Jesus goes on to say that Wherever the gospel news is preached, people will remember what she did for him. In other words, her good deed would be shared with everyone who hears the good news about Jesus. On the other hand, we see Judas, who is willing to sell Jesus out for money. Judas was one of the twelve, one of Jesus' followers, yet he let his attitude about money lead him to betray Jesus. The contrast between the two stories, the story of the woman with the perfume and the story of Judas betraying Jesus connects them. Mark doesn't explain why Judas betrays Jesus, but the book of John tells us that Judas was a thief in John 12, 4 through 6. But Judas, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor people? Now, he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put in it. He cared more about money than about Jesus. Judas was a thief. He had an attitude of selfishness. On the other hand, we see this woman who isn't even named with a different attitude. She gave something incredibly valuable to honor Jesus. She doesn't hold back. She pours out all the perfume, showing her deep love and respect for him. When the guests at the feast criticize her, Jesus defends her and says that her act of love will be remembered forever. Mark cleverly uses the words good to show that these stories have two different motives or plans. It helps highlight the contrast between the character's intentions. Jesus uses the word good in different ways in these stories. In Mark 14, 6, he says that what the woman did was good or beautiful. Then in Mark 14, 7, he says, you can always do good for the poor, but they won't always have him 
with them to honor in this way. Then in Mark 14, 9, he calls her deeds part of the good news, the gospel. Meanwhile, Mark 14, 11 indicates that Judas is looking for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. But the good that Judas seeks is marked by a twisted attitude of greed. This wordplay shows that man's intent to destroy the Messiah will actually become part of the gospel story, the good news. It fulfills God's will. It leads to his son's sacrifice for the salvation of humanity. In other words, these stories show us how two very different attitudes, love and greed, lead to two very different actions. The woman's love for Jesus led her to give generously, while Judas's love for money led him to betray Jesus. In the end, even the terrible plan to kill Jesus becomes part of God's greater plan to save us humans. The Jewish leader's plot and Judas's betrayal result in God's death. But through that death, God offers us forgiveness and new life in Jesus. It is said that the woman in this story is often identified as Mary. She had heard Jesus talk about his coming death and wanted to show her love for him before it was too late. She poured the perfume on Jesus, not worrying about the cost because her love for him was greater than any material possession. Judas, however, allowed his attitude about money to cloud his judgment. Even though he had been with Jesus and seen his miracles, Judas' heart was full of greed. He criticized Mary for wasting the perfume, pretending to care about the poor, but really, he just had a selfish attitude. His greed made him vulnerable to Satan's influence, leading him to betray Jesus for a few pieces of silver, half the value of the perfume, a half year's wage. Judas knew the religious leaders wanted Jesus dead, and he offered to help them for money. In the end, his attitude toward money led him to his own destruction. Our attitude shapes our actions, and our actions define who we are. The woman's attitude of love and generosity led the woman to do something beautiful for Jesus, something that would be remembered forever. Judas's attitude of greed led him to betray his Lord for money, a decision that led to his death. Every day we face choices that reveal what's in our hearts. Will we choose to love and be generous like the woman? Or will we let greed and selfishness like Judas lead us down the wrong path? But notice what Romans 8, 28 says. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. Remember this, though the intents of others may be for evil, just like that of Ju the Jewish leaders and Judas, God can turn what is intended for evil into good. Have the attitude of looking for good, even though others may have meant it for evil. God can turn a bad situation into something good. In other words, all things work together for the good of those who have the right attitude toward God and desire to carry out his purpose. In Mark 14, 22 through 31, we read about Jesus sharing his last supper with his disciples before his death. What was their attitude? Read Mark 14, 1 through 11 and 22 through 31 and Exodus 24, 8 to understand the significance of this last supper and its value to those who love God and desire to fulfill his purpose. Then view the next segment of this video, part three, The Last Supper. If you were sitting down for a special meal, knowing it would be your last, how would you feel? What would you say? Your attitude at that moment would show what's in your heart. We're exploring Mark 14, 1 through 11, 22 through 31 in Exodus 24, 8. This story shows us how our faith and attitude can guide us through the most difficult times in life. In Mark 14, 12, we learn that this story takes place during the first day of the unleavened bread celebration, the same day the Passover lamb was sacrificed. According to Exodus 12, 
the Jewish Passover celebration was filled with deep meaning for the Jewish people. The meal happened on Thursday evening, commemorating God's powerful deliverance of his people from Egyptian slavery and becoming God's covenant people at Sinai. During this meal, Jesus does something new. He starts what we now call the Lord's Supper. In Exodus 24 a Moses sprinkles the people with the blood of sacrificed animals and says, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. At the Last Supper, Jesus doesn't use a Passover lamb. Why? Because Jesus is the Lamb of God, as John proclaimed in John 1.29. The bread he shares with his disciples represents his body, and the cup of wine he shares represents his blood. Jesus explains, this is my blood, which begins the new covenant that Jeremiah spoke of in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, that God makes with his people. It is sealed with the blood of Jesus, and the cup represents this. He says, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. This new covenant is different from the one made at Sinai because it's sealed not with the blood of an animal, but with the blood of Jesus himself. Then Jesus tells his disciples something shocking. He predicts that all of them will abandon him. He quotes from Zechariah 13, 7, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my champion, says the Lord of hosts, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Then I will turn my hand against the little ones. When the shepherd is struck, the sheep will scatter. Jesus is the shepherd and his disciples are the sheep. This news is depressing. It makes the disciples sad, but by repeating the prediction that he will rise to life again, Jesus gives them hope. He adds that after he is raised from the dead, he will go ahead of them to Galilee. This prediction is so important that later it is referred to in the young man at Jesus' tomb in Mark 16, 7. Therefore, it carries special weight. But at the moment, the disciples are struggling to accept what Jesus is saying. Peter especially has a problem with what he is saying. Peter is so disturbed that he boldly declares that he will never leave Jesus, even if everyone else does. But Jesus, knowing Peter's heart, continues with the solemn talk and predicts that Peter will deny him three times before the rooster crows twice. Peter can't imagine this happening, but it does. Jesus' prediction will play a critical role in the scene of Jesus' trial and Peter's denial, just as it also plays a crucial role here. This is a reminder of faith and human weakness. Like Peter, we can have the wrong attitude about our abilities. Therefore, we sometimes make promises to God thinking we're stronger than we are. But when the test comes, we fail. Peter had a hard lesson to learn. When the rooster crowed, Peter realized he had denied Jesus just as Jesus predicted. Peter was heartbroken. He went out and wept bitterly, realizing his own weakness. But the story doesn't end there. Jesus even knowing his disciples would fail, maintain his attitude of love for them. The Passover meal, which looked back to Israel's deliverance from Egypt, also pointed forward to Jesus, the true Lamb of God. Just as the blood on the doorpost saved the Israelites from death, Jesus' blood saves us from sin and death. Jesus knew his disciples would be tested, but he didn't leave them without hope. He promised that after his resurrection, he would meet them in Galilee, showing them that even after their failures, they were still loved and still had a future with him. Jesus' prediction of what would happen to his disciples is a reminder that our attitudes, how we think and believe, affects every part of our lives. At times, our attitudes about our abilities can be flawed and wrong, especially when we seek to do things on our own without God. But Jesus shows us that even when we face challenges and even when we fail, there's always hope. Our faith isn't about being perfect. It's about trusting in God's love and forgiveness, just as Peter learned later. 
When we focus on Jesus and his promises, we find strength, hope, and the courage to keep going no matter what. Remember, attitude is everything. Let's have the right attitude of trusting not in self, but in all our ways, acknowledging God and trusting that he will direct our path. He promises to go ahead of us, just as he promised the disciples he would go ahead of them to Galilee. Walk in the attitude that he is always with us, guiding us and offering us a future filled with hope. Jesus' attitude in Mark 14, 32 through 42 was most crucial to our salvation. What was Jesus' attitude in the Garden of Gethsemane? Despite his disciples' inability to pray with him, read Mark 14, 32 through 42, then continue to the next segment of this video, part four, Gethsemane. When in a place so heavy with sorrow that it feels like the weight of the world is pressing down on you, what do you do? Who do you turn to? Our attitude in times of deep distress reveals what we truly believe. We look at how Jesus faced his darkest hour in the Garden of Gethsemane despite his inability to get support from his disciples. We see how his attitude shaped his decisions and it shows us how to handle our own struggles. In Mark 14, 32 through 42, we see Jesus leaving the walled city of Jerusalem where they eat the Passover meal, leading his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a garden on the slope of the Mount of Olives, a place called Gethsemane. The name Gethsemane means oil press, suggesting that there was an olive oil processing press in the vicinity. A fitting name because Jesus was about to be pressed under the weight of the world's sins. The exact location is unknown because the Romans cut down all the trees on the Mount of Olives during the siege in AD 70. As they reached the garden, Jesus leaves most of his disciples at the entrance to take Peter, James, and John a little farther with him. But even these three are soon left behind as Jesus continues alone. The deeper he goes into the garden, the more alone, isolated, and sorrowful he feels as he prepares to face the upcoming suffering for our sins. Jesus begins to pray, asking God to remove the suffering, but he adds something crucial to his prayer. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. He uses the term Abba to show his close and personal relationship with God. Abba is the Aramaic term which Mark translates as father. Jesus wasn't using a casual word like daddy, but rather a word that reflects deep respect and intimacy with the father. Jesus prays to his father, asking him to remove the cup of suffering, but he submits himself not to his will, but to the will of God, which parallels with the Lord's prayer found in Matthew 16. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Even though Jesus asked for suffering to be taken away, God's answer to Jesus' prayer was no. He does not remove the cup of suffering Jesus had to experience on the cross. It was the only way to save us. It was the only way that God could offer salvation to our world. This teaches us something important about faith. Sometimes God's answer to our prayers is not what we want, but it's always what we need. Jesus accepted God's will, even though it meant facing unimaginable pain and suffering. When experiencing suffering, it pays to have good supportive friends. In those moments of deep sorrow, Jesus wanted his friends, his disciples to support him. He went back to Peter, James, and John three times, hoping they would stay awake and pray with him. But each time he found them asleep. It's a reminder that even the people closest to us can fail us when we need them the most. Yet Jesus didn't give up. He kept praying, finding strength in his father's relationship with him. Paul in Philippians 4.13 talks about doing all things 
through the one who strengthens us. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Just as Paul found strength in Jesus, Jesus found strength from the Father to face what was coming ahead. Three times he came seeking comfort from his disciples. Three times they were sleeping. In the end, he arose through the strength he received from his father. He went forth with the father and to face his trials. Because of the strength he received from his father, he is ready. His disciples are not. There was nothing Satan could do to penetrate his faith in his father. As Jesus prayed in the garden, he was preparing himself for the ultimate sacrifice. He knew the trials were coming and he faced it with courage and obedience. When he finally returned to his disciples, he found them asleep once more. But this time he woke them up and told them it was time to go. He was ready, even if they were not. Our attitude in times of trouble can make all the difference. Jesus faced his darkest hour with an attitude of trust and obedience to his father's will. He didn't run from the pain. Instead, he leaned into his father's relationship with full strength to carry on. In our lives, we will face difficult times. But like Jesus, we can choose to trust God's plan, knowing that he will give us the strength we need to go through it. Remember, Attitude is everything. When we focus on God and trust in his love, we can face anything that comes our way. Mark 14, 43 through 52 tells us what happens to the disciples who fell to pray at this most crucial moment. What happened? Read Mark 14, 43 through 52. Then continue to the next segment of this video, part five, leaving all to flee from Jesus. Have you ever been betrayed by someone you trusted? Perhaps a close friend or a relative? What was your attitude? How did you feel? What did you do? Jesus faced this very situation, but his attitude was not one of revenge, fighting back or running away. Jesus remained calm and steadfast, focusing on God's plan. His attitude teaches us an important lesson and our attitude shape how we face the most difficult moments in life. We examine Mark 14, 43 through 52 on what happened when Jesus is betrayed and what it means for us. It is shocking that one of Jesus' closest associates betrayed him to his enemies. In Mark 14, 43 through 52, we read about a terrible betrayal. Judas, one of Jesus' closest followers, turns against him. Judas's attitude or motivation is explained in the book, The Desire of Ages. It says that Judas had naturally a strong love for money, but he had not always been corrupt enough to do such a deed as this. He had fostered the evil spirit of avarice until it had become the ruling motive of his life. The love of money overbalanced his love for Christ. Through becoming the slave of the vice, he gave himself to Satan to be driven to any length in sin. Over time, his love for money took over his heart, leading him to betray Jesus. Betrayal is something everyone sees as wrong, even the people who use or benefit from a betrayal's actions. For example, in Matthew 27, 3 through 7, after Judas betrays Jesus, even though the religious leaders use him to carry out their plan, they still despise the act of betrayal themselves. This shows that betrayal is universally condemned even by those who take advantage of it. What makes Judas' betrayal even worse is that he tries to hide it under the disguise of friendship. In Mark 14, 44, it says, he tells the terrible mob, whoever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him and lead him away safely. Judas walks up to Jesus, kisses him, and the soldiers arrest him. It appears that by the kiss of friendship, Judas likely was trying to hide his betrayal from Jesus and the other disciples. He didn't want them to know what he had done. This act of betrayal 
Guys, as friendship shows us how sin can deceive and destroy us if we don't guard our hearts against Satan's evil suggestions. Having the right attitude is possible only through the power of the Holy Spirit working in our hearts. As soon as Jesus is arrested, chaos erupts. One of Jesus' followers, Peter, according to John 18, 10, and 11, pulls out a sword and cuts off the ear of a servant of the high priest. Peter's attitude was one of revenge. He thought he could fight to protect Jesus, but Jesus tells him to stop. Jesus knew that God's plan was unfolding and fighting wouldn't change it. Instead, Jesus chews out the mob for coming at night when they could have arrested him in the temple during the day. He reminds them saying in Mark 14, 49, I was daily with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me, but the scripture must be fulfilled. Even in the middle of betrayal and violence, Jesus stays focused on fulfilling God's plan. What happens next though is heartbreaking. All of Jesus' disciples run away just as he had predicted they would. Even Peter, who said he would never leave Jesus, runs. Jesus is left alone, surrounded by people who wanted to kill him. Peter, however, reappears following Jesus from a distance and ends up putting himself at risk. Mark 14, 51 and 52 also tells us about a young man who was following Jesus, but when the soldiers grabbed him, he ran away so fast that he left his clothes behind. He chose to run from Jesus rather than stay with him. This part of the story is only found in the Gospel of Mark. What is interesting is that he runs away naked. This story shows us how quickly the attitude of self-preservation and fear can take over, even for those closest to Jesus. Judas was so controlled by his love for money that he betrayed Jesus. The disciples were so afraid that they abandoned him. Even a young man who was likely trying to follow Jesus ran away when things got dangerous. Instead of giving all to follow Jesus, he gave all, including his clothes, to run away from Jesus. Ellen White tells us in the book, The Desire of Ages, that the disciples were confused and scared. They couldn't understand why Jesus was letting himself be arrested. They were offended that he didn't fight back, and in their fear, they ran away. But Jesus knew this was part of God's plan. He had already told them that they would be scattered, but that he was not truly alone because his father was with him. Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. Jesus' betrayal and arrest were distressing, but were necessary for God's plan to be fulfilled to save us. Jesus had to go through this suffering so that he could die for our sins. Just as the high priest would sprinkle the blood of a sacrifice on the mercy seat to cleanse the people, Jesus' blood was about to be shed. There is a danger of letting sin take over our hearts. Judas let his love for money control him until it led him to destroy Jesus. We need to guard our hearts and rely on Jesus' strength to fight against sin. Even when everyone else abandons us, God is always with us. Jesus was left alone, but he trusted in God's plan. Our attitudes, especially in difficult moments, can shape our entire lives. We must choose to trust in God rely on his strength, and follow Jesus even when it's hard. Attitude is everything. Let's choose the attitude of faith and trust in God's plan for us. Let us not give up all, even our clothes, to run away from Jesus. Although Peter ran away from Jesus, he resurfaced at Jesus' trial. What is Jesus' attitude at the trial in contrast to that of Peter? Read Mark 14, 60 through 72. Then continue to the next segment of this video, part six. Who are you? Have you ever made a promise and then broken it? Maybe you really wanted to do the right thing, but when things got tough, 
you let fear or doubt take over. We look at two different reactions to pressure. Jesus, who stood firm, and Peter, who struggled when placed under pressure. Both moments have something important to teach us about our attitudes, our choices, and how God responds to us when we fail. In Mark 14, 60 through 72, we see two important stories happening at the same time. Jesus is on trial facing his enemies, while Peter is outside denying that he even knows Jesus. In Mark 14, 53 through 59, we find that after Jesus is arrested, he's taken to the Sanhedrin, the Jewish religious court. This is the first part of his trial. At this trial, the leaders are determined to find something to accuse him of, but they can't get the witnesses to agree on anything. All the testimonies they bring up about Jesus are false, and the witnesses can never agree. Finally, the high priest places him under oath before God, according to Matthew 26, 63, and asks Jesus a direct question. But Jesus keeps silent. And the high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. At first, Jesus is silent. But when the high priest puts him under oath before God, Jesus answers in Mark 14, 62, I am. He then references Daniel 7, 13 through 14, where it talks about the Son of Man coming in the clouds and sitting on the right hand of God. Thus, Jesus boldly declares the truth about who he is, even though he knows it will lead to his death. This is more than the high priest could stand. He refuses to believe him. He tears his clothes in anger and declares that Jesus is guilty of blasphemy. He calls for a verdict and the council agrees and condemns him. They then begin to humiliate him by spitting on him, covering his face and beating him and mocking him, asking him to prophesy as to who hit him. While Jesus stands firm before his enemies, giving a faithful testimony, Peter is outside trying to avoid trouble. He gives a lying report. Note that this is the sixth and final sermon story in Mark. Two paralleling characters, Jesus and Peter, take opposite actions. Jesus gives a faithful testimony and Peter a false one. Three times people ask Peter if he knows Jesus and three times Peter denies it. He even begins to curse and swear to convince the crowd that he does not know Jesus. But at his third attempt, a rooster crows for the second time and Peter remembers what Jesus had told him. Mark 14, 30, assuredly, I say to you that today, even this night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. Peter suddenly remembers Jesus's prophecy that he would deny his Lord three times that very night. Realizing what he had done, Peter breaks down and cries. Jesus stands firm. He knows who he is and he's not afraid to speak the truth even when it leads to suffering. He doesn't fight back or try to escape the situation. Instead, he accepts God's plan for him with courage. Even when he was treated with cruelty, Jesus remained calm and focused on fulfilling his mission. Peter, on the other hand, crumbles under pressure. His fear for his own safety leads him to deny Jesus three times. Peter had the wrong attitude. He thought he was strong. But when the moment came, he gave in to fear. It says in the book, Early Writings, fear for his own safety led him to declare that he knew not the man. But something beautiful happens at the end of the story. When Peter denies Jesus for the third time, Jesus turns and looks at Peter. That look wasn't one of anger, but of love and compassion. It broke Peter's heart and Peter wept bitterly. That moment of failure became a turning point for Peter, and he later became one of the strongest leaders in the early church. This incident reminds us that even when we fail, Jesus doesn't abandon us. Just as he forgave Peter, 
He is ready to forgive us when we come to him with the humble heart. No matter how often we stumble, Jesus is always ready to forgive us and help us grow stronger. Remember that having the right attitude is everything. The right attitude is to follow Jesus' example, trusting not in self, but in God's plan. When we trust in ourselves, we fail. Nevertheless, if we should fail, let us sorrowfully and humbly turn back to Jesus, knowing that he loves us and forgives us and is always there for us. Thank you for watching this video. To be notified when my next video comes out, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Sabbath School Daily by Dr. Brenda Ware Davis. You may also watch many of our videos at SabbathSchoolDaily.com. The free study guide for this series is available at sabbath.school or ssnet.org. If you enjoyed this video, click like, then share. Thank you for liking, sharing, and subscribing.